This conversation will not be all about me, but rather my guest, Jonathan Betcher, who bears a striking resemblance to the lead singer of Panic at the Disco, Mr. Brendan Urie. Now, conversation with Jonathan goes to a lot of fun places, a lot of um, deep places about his spiritual journey, but begins in a rather strange place, talking about boots and the... Uh, English style boots that he happened to wear into the uh, studio. We got into a fun conversation about that without realizing that our microphones weren't turned on. But eventually we do get the microphones on and by the end I think it's fair to say that he did convince me to buy the Thursday boots. If you're wondering where I'm at right now, I'm actually in London on a Thursday finishing the edits for this video and it's been, gosh, several weeks since the conversation. The, uh, the beard went away, the mustache went away, much to my wife's chagrin, but don't worry, it'll be coming back soon. Did the uh, Ted Lasso tour yesterday. A lot more to report about Mr. Lasso in an upcoming video. So without any further ado, Mr. Jonathan Betcher and some shoe wisdom. Hopefully our audio sounds even better now yeah, with now this you boot can, wisdom. Now you can very clearly hear the boot wisdom that I'm sharing with you now. And it might be the most important thing yeah. that we talk this about. This podcast brought to you by Thursday Boots. <laughs> That's right. Um, so yeah, uh, cosmetically as they wear, they just look better and better. And also uh, on this boot, I had like the eyelet mm. came out at, at one point. Um, and so the piece that you kind of loop the laces around and I found that I could just buy a new eyelet and, and put it in there and fix it. And so it was like, whenever your boots start to come apart, like they're, the materials are good enough quality that mm -hmm. like it's beneficial to just invest the time and energy to fix them. Do you have like so. a history of like cobbling skills? <laughs> no. Um, but I do have a history of, just figuring things out. If something um, breaks, that's an opportunity for you to learn something. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That awesome. was kind of like, that was how our family was when we grew up. My dad was very much like a, we fix everything ourselves mm. kind of person. And so that's just translated into like every area of life from house to footwear. You know, <laughs> you just... From head to toe. And, and YouTube <laughs> has made that much yeah, yeah, yeah. easier. It's like, I can hear from an expert on any topic to learn how to fix things so i mean that's basically how we learned how to do almost everything for the coffee shop i mean we did not yeah. go to coffee shop school yeah right or, 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 or if we did it was youtube.com yeah right and when things break mm -hmm. um there you know design inspiration um there's just there's almost like no limit to, to what you can kind of figure out like in my mind if anything happens my first instinct is let me check youtube yeah. because i can probably there's somebody else who's probably felt now let, let's actually let's start with this because this is interesting yeah. like there's somebody else like what do you think the motivation is for somebody who shares a type of here's how i did this video mm. what, like because they could have just done it i assume you didn't post your you know foot repair or boot repair to youtube <laughs> so what do you yeah. think is going on in in the mind of a of somebody as a creator i guess yeah that's a that's a good question i and we'll introduce you and why i'm asking you specifically that sure. sort of creative side of yeah yeah the moment. yeah i i mean i don't i don't necessarily know because there are lots of things that i feel like i'm good at and lots of skills that I have that I don't share on YouTube. <laughs> so so I'm probably not the best person to ask because I'm not a YouTube content creator. Okay. But I I do think that there is um 
I think there is like this innate sense that when you're passionate about something and you're good at it, you've kind of been on a journey to get to that point of expertise. And there's some kind of joy and fulfillment that comes with sharing it with other people. Okay. And social media and YouTube have all kind of created this environment where <clears throat> there's there's just kind of this opportunity or uh, promise of like, oh, I could post this on the internet and thousands of people could maybe see it. And that's just kind of an exciting possibility to entertain. It's like, oh, I, you know, I want to be able to share this and who knows what could happen. And so for some people, yeah. it's probably like they maybe want to be uh, YouTube seen, famous, YouTube famous, <laughs> yeah. or for some people, it might just be like, I don't really care how many people see it, but I enjoy being able to share knowledge. I, I want to be seen as some kind of an expert and there's just kind of some sort of joy in being able to teach a craft that you're good at or, or maybe not a craft, maybe subject matter or something sure, like sure. that. We, we feel fulfilled in being seen. Um, in fact, I think maybe one of the deepest we're going deep. We're like That's, real sudden. Of course we're going deep. Um, th there's this like deep, may maybe the earliest human desire is to be seen. Like mm. whenever you're born into the world, you open your eyes for the very first time and you're looking for someone who's looking for you. Like, like babies are looking for the eye contact of their mother or their father and it's like this deep urge that we have from the very beginning of life that mm -hmm. we want to be, we, we're looking for somebody who's looking for us. We want to be seen and to be known um, by another person. And so I think that never goes away and it well, you know changes why it never, form. You know why it never goes away? Or the, the example that's resonating for me as you're painting this picture is that scene in Interstellar. Matt Damon, who's uncredited in the film, yeah. <laughs> is brought back. I just got chills. Like he's brought back to life on the Lazarus Project. Yeah, right. And and he just, he looks at these people who were absolute strangers. Yeah, right. And just explodes in, in tears and says, you know, pray you never know what it's like to long for the, to be looked upon by another human being, something yeah, like that. Yeah, right, right. Because like, he's been in isolation for yes. so long. Right? It, it, and so he has this, this rebirth to that sort of core thing of he's been on this journey without anyone else. And, yeah. and maybe right. part of that is, is sort of being seen. Yeah, and I think, I think as we get older, we really like to be seen for the parts of ourselves that we're proud of. The parts of ourself that we feel like is our best. Sure. And so, like, I think on some deep human level, maybe some of the motivation, whether it's on YouTube or in other environments, some of the motivation for wanting to share what we're masterful at is it's the part of ourself that we're that we take the most joy and pride in, mm -hmm. and that's, that's appropriate the part, pride. Appropriate pride. Yeah, it's the part of ourself that we want. We want to be seen, mm. um, and there are other parts of ourselves that we don't mm. want to curate an image that's that's more that might not be as might not be as holistic. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that's the that's the dark underside of YouTube and social mm. media is it gives us this opportunity to be seen and to be known in some sense. 
Um, but on terms that we might be able to control. On terms that we're able to control and, and not completely. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've really valued about listening to this project that you're doing is I really have enjoyed and valued like the authenticity and the courage, the personal courage of you and of your guests to just like share and disclose mm -hmm. um, parts of their journey, parts of their self that maybe aren't the parts that they're most proud of. Um, and, and there's, ways to do that that are appropriate on the internet sure. and there are ways to do yeah, that yeah. that are only appropriate in deep intimate relationship mm -hmm. but i think that there's space on the internet um space on youtube for an appropriate disclosure of um parts of ourself that we're not proud of and i think this kind of environment where it's like we're gonna have a conversation this was this was part of what you talked about with Jordan um, was sort of this format of communication that is mm. both intimate and personal but it's also you're like inviting a broader audience into yeah. that personal intimate we're, moment <clears throat> we're okay with or even feel called to to be seen mm -hmm. yeah and it's like the there's something qualitatively different between like me having this kind of conversation with a camera mm. and a disembodied audience sure, like looking to camera like yeah right um that puts me in a different frame of of mind and the just the it's missing the aspects of embodied relationship and it doesn't even have to be embodied like you can have that kind of conversation but the relational context sure, yeah. uh, and connection that happens that i am not just being seen but i see you and i know your story as well and so i think that what you're doing here with this project and and there are lots of other examples of this kind of communication is like the healthy version of what the internet can be mm -hmm. where it's like we're going to model healthy relational conversation mm -hmm. in a way that other people can kind of benefit from what we learn together in that context. And the, the way for someone to consume that media in a healthy way is not for it to be a substitute for healthy relationships sure, in their sure. own life, but to be a model Yeah, yeah. that they can say like, Oh, I really enjoyed how they had that conversation and I want to find people in my own life that I can trust and build that kind of connection with where I can have that healthy kind of relationship as well. And I can, I can benefit from the learnings of those other conversations and it expands the horizon of like possibility and, yeah. and like, learning that I can hopefully have. people feel called into something like this that they can do whether it's in person like mm -hmm. even if it just sort of elevates or, or deepens their relationship uh, at uh, a coffee shop or a, yeah. a conversation you know just or at right. the dinner table or something like that yeah the, the example that comes to mind for me again is uh, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris mm -hmm. of how they really attempted and failed yeah. to understand each other at the beginning. Right. And but they were willing came, to acknowledge yes, that. <laughs> they, and they like that is it was so instructive. It was like, oh, my gosh, like maybe what I when I have sort of misconnected with somebody mm. like maybe that was me. Like they, they weren't saying what I thought they were saying. What I heard wasn't necessarily what they were saying. Yeah. And then as they sort of expanded their public conversations onto like actual stages, yeah. they would bring in a third. Yeah. They would bring in a moderator and say, okay, if we start to you know, go off the rails again and, and you, mm -hmm. moderator, we'll, we'll call this our moderator. You know, if you, if you <laughs> it's, see it's or Ted. hear... Okay, Ted, that even better. He's going he's gonna to help us. If you see or hear me missing what's being said, yeah. you know, call that out. Yeah. And then even, I think this is where I first heard it, this idea of steel manning somebody's argument. Are you familiar with this? Mm -mm, okay. No. So you know what a straw man sort of argument is. You know, you take the weakest version of what somebody is saying yeah. just so you can tear it down and hmm. score points and dunk on them. And the, the Internet is filled with right. straw manning people's arguments. Yeah. So steel man is basically to where if you say something 
I have to say it back to you in as strong of a version as possible of, mm. of what I heard so that you first agree yeah. with how I've recapitulated it to you Yeah. before not, we actually discuss and maybe debate. So I'm not pushing yeah. back on something that you're not saying. Yeah, and it's not, it's not the strongest version in terms of like the most intense version no, of what no. you're saying. It's, it's the clearest. It's, it's the, the, the clearest. Tru- the truthiest. And the, yeah, the truthiest. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like... If I if I agreed with you and I were advocating for your position, here's exactly. how I would say it. Exactly. Right. To to make sure that there's understanding there. Before you steal man Sam's point, how did you feel about his encapsulation of yours? <laughs> well, I, I'm convinced, man. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the spirit of steel manning mm-hmm. someone else is as just it stayed with me. So everything you just mm-hmm. described about learning from the example of someone else having a public conversation, like that steel manning piece has, has yeah. been huge with it. I like that. Okay, so we we jumped in and, and we got deep, you know, quickly, <laughs> which is what I had hoped for, and and I'm I'm glad because we. It's amazing the places that boots can take. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. These these boots were made for walking, <laughs> <laughs> and and jumping right in. Apparently. Jumping right in. Um, they are waterproof, so I'm, you can get right I'm, into I'm the mud. I'm gonna get some of those boots. I, I, they're they're phenomenal. They're they're really well done. Yeah. Um, but let's let's back up and give a little bit of context because we have done some life together. Like we yeah. have a history and we have a future and like, but people may not know who you are. True. You know, yet. yeah. Right. And so, how do you, how would you knowing this context a little bit? How would you feel best to sort of. Um, introduce yourself and actually people who have watched the canonical conversation yeah. do know a little bit of who you are through your four Evansville hat right. so maybe outside or in addition to your four Evansville hat you know how would you want to maybe introduce yourself especially yeah in light of, of media and creativity yeah yeah so um, yeah and I'm trying to think of of how to frame up life together I feel like because we both live in Evansville and are kind of in some of the same circles, I don't, I don't actually remember when we first met or I when I first became acquainted. I okay, so we went to the Q conference together okay. in Nashville. Okay, and so Ross Chapman, right. um, who is the founder of Four Evansville, yes, a mutual friend, invited and that me. Was probably in twenty seventeen. Sounds about right. Yeah, something. sixteen or seventeen, yeah, something I like that. that. And yeah. Brett Nicholson. Um, that's also where we sort of really sort of met and yeah. got got deep was right. we carpooled together on that sort of same trip. Okay. Okay. So that's, oh, and I heard you reference that in your conversation yeah, with yeah. Brett. So and I, I wondered Brett, if that was I wondered if that was the same, same trip. conference. So, yeah. yeah. So I remember in that auditorium <clears throat> you came up to like sort of the same table and we maybe have seen each other, but that was like the first sort of like handshake. Yeah. Exchange names. Right. And then we had good discussion at that table and yeah. it was like, okay, we're, there's a kindred spirit here and we can right. continue this. So all Very right. Cool. So that's where we met. Yes. So yeah. Now yeah, so yourself. who who I am. Who are you? Uh, so I'm the current executive director of Four Evansville and um, I think any relevance that that has to this conversation probably has to do with that conversation that we had on the podcast and this idea that, um, you know, for Evansville is all about advancing human flourishing through the church. So the way that I think about that from a personal perspective is I, I want to create opportunities through our work for people to see, um, kind of like a vision of Christianity um, being lived out in a community that they would say like that's that's really good whether I whether I agree with it or not like I want to live next to that kind of person sure. you know what I mean which is what people have been saying about Jordan Hall recently hmm. that, that like as his life as a Christian is becoming sort of more well known and seen yeah in fact there was someone I just heard yesterday who said like I want what he has. Yeah. And he's he's just being this way now yeah. in in a new context. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I and so the work that we do is is um you know, we we don't need to get into that here, but that's kind of like the the heart that I have, the passion that I have for that work is along those lines. You you, you all serve you serve pastors. You have public events, you know, forums mm-hmm. for people to to hear from from those in the community that don't necessarily ha- always have a platform. Mm-hmm. And 
create a context for it that generates uh, meaningful discussions. And then it, these are all people in the community. So yep. then hopefully they can move forward and, and respond to whatever sort of problems or challenges yeah. or opportunities have come from that. Yeah. And then the, the, the part that I, that I would love for you to talk a little bit more detail about is the, the film aspect of sure. it. And, and that feels like your, one of your superpowers. I won't say your, your only superpower, sure. but like you definitely have a gift that you've cultivated, mm -hmm. like give, give you credit for cultivating it, but like film is part of your gift. So take take us back pre for Evansville to like when you started to understand that gift maybe and that'll help sure. to introduce you I think yeah so I would say I would probably describe that gift of film in a little bit broader terms and I would describe it as um, may, maybe the term would be sense making or being able to being able to um, process sometimes complex experiences, stories, topics, and then translate them in a way that is understood on, on multiple different levels. So mm -hmm. the thing that I love about film is that it has all of these different elements that you can work with to communicate meaning to an audience um, in a way that's intellectual, in a way that's personal, in a way that's emotional, mm. experiential. And we got into film for that reason, because there are all of these complex challenges that exist within our community. And a lot of the barriers to helping people work together are barriers of understanding. And mm. I mean like deep understanding sure. that comes from relationship, that comes from experience. And film kind of creates this um, artistic, gentle, beautiful way to open the door for somebody and begin to ask the right questions. I don't think that film by itself um, can accomplish everything that we want to accomplish in terms of inspiring empathy, but I think it it softens people up enough to be like, huh, you know, may, maybe I do want to lean into some of those more. It's relational more of an experience. <laughs> it's, it, you, you can you can receive information, even receiving information at, at sort of different levels to, mm -hmm. to know what's going on. Yeah. But with film and film done well, you can experience somebody else at a, a scale that's not as possible yeah. if it's just based on sort of. Dunbar number, Dunbar number level sort right. of relational limitations. Yeah, and I and I would say similar to how we were talking about this type of media format. One of the things that we just kind of stumbled across in the filmmaking process with For Evansville that has proven to be really valuable and impactful was um, I would start with conversations. Like mm. the films were narrative and they were uh, fictional narrative. So like I was writing a story and had total control over the narrative and the characters and what they think and felt and did. But all of that was informed by um, research to like really understand issues in our community. <clears throat> but then conversations with people who were most affected by whatever topic we were trying to highlight in the film and that ha that's like one of the most formative experiences of my life has mm -hmm. been those films because it's afforded me the opportunity to sit across from people and have these really deep, intimate conversations about things that I would have never talked to them mm -hmm. about. And so... So you, you sort of write a script, you write a story... And then through that, you recognize these are the areas of research that I need to do to be able to better tell that story. And then the, well, that... I don't I don't write the script first. Oh, we, okay, we okay. just start with a topic it, okay. or a question. So it's, it's even broader than that. Then and so it's a the conversation. It's a, are starting to. Yes, it's gotcha. a it's a wide open discovery process. It's hey, we want to do a film about substance abuse and addiction. I'm going to go talk to people who know about that. 
So that I'm way gonna, you're, you're not falling for like confirmation bias of like, exactly. I really need a story to fit this character that exactly. I've created without enough exactly. understanding beforehand. And okay. so and so the journey that I kind of go on as a creative is I'm just wide open. I want to learn from people. I want to listen. And so I'll do some research to kind of get my bearings about what, you know, what's been said about this, what's been studied about it in our community. And then I, I go and I sit with people um, in uh, for like, for example, with the substance abuse and addiction one, I talked to uh, folks who worked in like recovery um, organizations, um, both as practitioners and administrators, I talked to people who had struggled with substance abuse and addiction in the past, I talked with people who were struggling with substance abuse and addiction right now mm-hmm. and were like, I don't, I don't know if this is going to kill me or not, you know, and being able to listen to them about that experience and kind of enter into what is that like for you? And, um, you know, talk to our County coroner about, Mm -hmm. Hey, what is it like when you respond to an overdose and you show up to a house and there's a parent who has died and their kids are there? Like, tell me what's that, what is that like for you? And tell me about this in our community and like, what's your vantage point on this? And that's like, just, that's been incredibly formative for me. And what happens is I'm kind of like shaped by those conversations and experiences. My perspective is shaped. My like sense of self in some ways is like formed by that. Um, and then I take that journey and I try to, I try to translate that into a story that's going to give the audience a little bit of a taste of that same journey. Like those conversations aren't actually filmed and are a part of, 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 of of like a documentary or something. It's, it's more, it's forming you so that you can then form a a narrative and a, right. And I'm drawing out themes and I'm, and I'm, pinpointing what are the things that I've learned and then I'm and then I'm crafting a story that kind of reflects all of those things and packages them in eight minutes you know and and reflects them and so a lot of those things are are not there a lot of them are very subtle and I think uh, you you wouldn't look at one of the films and and necessarily be able to name all of those things but there's like a there's like an essence of that journey that's created and reflected that just kind of, I think it impacts people in a certain way that is hard to even put words to. And then, like I said, the the goal is to just open them up mm-hmm. to the topic and to be able to then learn more about it and hopefully find how they can engage in whatever that need is. So why don't so you talk about being able to name things. Why don't you name actually a couple of your, your films and kind of the, mm-hmm. the timeline of it and then also, you know, the the response and and even some of the accolades that, that yeah. the film and, yeah. and if you want to shout out you know some of your collaborators as well like that yeah great. sure yeah so the first film that we did is called left turn and it's the journey of uh this guy who's just out on a run matt from, effinger matt effinger that's right <laughs> um and he he finds he finds himself running through a disinvested neighborhood and it's kind of his internal monologue about like things that he's thinking I was surprised at how different this neighborhood looked, and it was less than a mile from my house. I noticed little details that raised questions in my mind, like, why is this man just sitting there at 7.30 in the morning drinking? Is he one of those people you hear about who'd rather live off of food stamps than work at a job? And what about these kids? Shouldn't they be getting ready for school? Don't their parents care enough to tell them not to play in the street? How do these people live like this? Where's their self-respect? And what about this kid? Where are his parents? What chance does he have growing up in a place like this? 
then a lot of his assumptions are just completely challenged and undone. And it's an invitation to the audience to have their assumptions about poverty and about disinvested neighborhoods um, likewise mm. challenged and undone. And it's a short film, right? What's the runtime? Uh, it's, it's probably seven minutes or so. Yeah. And all of our films are, are very short like that. So so we've done Left Turn. We've done Left Turn 2. Um, we did a film called Care about uh, foster care. Uh, a film called Intervene, which is about uh, substance abuse and addiction. Um, our most recent film is uh, called Fragile Strength, and it's about um, organizations sort of partnering with schools to help students be successful. Thanks for coming. If this is about the debate team, I've already made up my mind. I know. I want to show you something. Valerie, this is Trevor. He leads the robotics department that your brother is now a member of. You already know Miss Bell. This is her friend Erin. She's offered to give your brother a ride to school when she drops off her son. This is Sam. He's from the church down the street. And this is Lauren and Gary. They both live in the neighborhood. If you won't back down from a challenge, then neither will we. So what do you say? You give another try? So three of those films uh, have won regional Emmys, uh, which was just kind of like this cool thing that we never expected was even like a, a possibility. I should have had you bring your Emmy statue. I could, could have just, just right piled them know, all up. Like, so I, I cool. do carry them around with me most of the time. Um, <laughs> do you know who I am? <laughs> right. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think it is definitely important to acknowledge that those accolades and the films uh, are not – resting on on my shoulders or creative abilities alone uh, we've worked with um, uh, an excellent director named chris weatherly who yeah. is here in evansville he's got like like 30 emmys so is he really 30 uh, is <laughs> probably an exaggeration but he's, he has he's really he's really good we're gonna, he has we're a gonna lot. work with he's, him with um with a honeymoon project yeah. uh, in, in the future here. So, yeah. yeah. So he's, he's, he's very, very good. And if you want to win an Emmy, the st- <laughs> <We're good. laughs> like, like if I can give you any storytelling advice, it's hire Chris We're, Weatherly yeah. <laughs> to be your director. Awesome. Um, but then like, there's a whole team of creatives who make a film happen. And that's one of the things that I've learned to love about mm. filmmaking is it is a collaborative process. And as a writer, you come up with this story and you like envision what the film is going to be. And the actual film that gets produced is very, very different Mm. because there are all of these opportunities for creative decisions to be made by other people. And so different films that we've done have had different like numbers of people working on them. Um, But yeah, there, there's, there are a lot of very talented local filmmakers who have brought those stories to life as well as, actors and things sure, like that. Sure. So. And, and even though these these are sort of problems and challenges and opportunities that are specific to Evansville and that's that's the backdrop and the mm-hmm. actors and everything like yeah. you're saying, they are also more, they're, they're much more broadly applicable oh, yeah. than, they, than they're, just that. Yeah, they're, um, they're topics that are relevant to every community, I think. Um, so yeah. yeah, I definitely feel that way. All right, so I'm gonna let's make a left turn. Yeah, let's let's go into what happened in our previous conversation together, mm-hmm. and what maybe you remember from that, and then also sort of what's been sort of sparked up in you in the last mm-hmm. month, month and a half of of wanting to maybe revisit it and maybe take take a, a, a sequel to that conversation yeah. you know in into a certain direction cuz we've been texting and and yeah. wanting to have this conversation and I'm I am very aligned and open with where you want to take it. Can so. I just also say I, I appreciate the explicit step that For Evansville has has made in this direction cuz I think that there was sort of two directions or or two missions that that people in the community could have picked up on that mm-hmm. that were the mission. Sure. And sort of the the flourishing of the city, you know, in in a way that does not um, acknowledge sort of the the Christian sort of founding and and undertones or overtones of of what you know is often what Four Evansville is about. And so I, I think it's just very refreshing that the cards are on the table sure. and that mm-hmm. that will generate different kinds of conversations yeah. and put things. Um, 
out there that that might make people uncomfortable, but are true to the way that you just articulated those values. So sure. kudos and like, <laughs> let's, let's go, let's, let's yeah. see what yeah. sorts of, you know, more deep and real, you know, conversations come from yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, that conversation was like, uh, it, it kind of encapsulates, I think a pretty important turning point for, for Evansville of like, right. It was like really, right after you would just, yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so the way I would characterize that turning point is for Evansville has kind of always been motivated by the gospel and, and by this very like holistic perspective of the gospel that we we believe that God is making all things new through Jesus and mm. that followers of Jesus ought to reflect that in their local community in transformative ways and in every context not just sort of their participation in their church yeah and not just uh yeah not just a spiritual context but yeah, like yeah. we're part of the fabric of the community and our participation in the community ought to um ought to reflect that vision of hope that we mm. have for the community um it's like if there's someone in your family who's suffering it's not, it's like okay th this is this is where our attention needs to go if there's someone maybe in your neighborhood that's suffering, a similar sort of like attention mm -hmm. should go. And if you expand that all the way to your community as someone who would identify as a Christian and responds mm -hmm. to the call to, to live in the way of Jesus, then your your bandwidth for compassion, mm -hmm. the suffering with, needs to reflect that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that. And I, and I would go even further to say go further that in a community where 84 percent of people identify as Christian, we ought not see the type of systemic inequity mm. that we see in Evansville mm. because systems are made up of people. And if most of those people are Christian and we're seeing these kinds of um, inequities in yeah. our community, then the church has some level of responsibility that it sure. needs to bear for that um and uh, and so i think for evansville has always kind of been behind the scenes motivated by this vision of like the christians in our community have an opportunity to make transformational change for the mm. good of everybody mm. and i think in its inception um for evansville sort of took this posture of like we want to um we want to kind of foster a sense of like faith neutrality mm. so that because one of what so one of our core values now is inclusive collaboration and it's this idea that we want to be able to work together with anybody in our community that we believe that everybody has something of value that they bring to our community and and we want to create environments where people can bring their whole self to the table and so our our like the way that we approached that, I think, was there There was like a, a sense of like we need to kind of like hold back mm. in communicating really openly and directly about that uh, motivation because it might be a barrier for other people. And I think a lot of that is because a lot of times I, I, I think there are a lot of assumptions that could be made if you start using that kind of language about yeah. what you're trying to do. And so I think the transition for us has been to recognize that there, there is a way to be explicitly motivated by the gospel and explicitly Christian and also to create this precedent of like inclusive collaboration mm -hmm. that it's sort of like, I'm going to, I'm going to be blatantly Christian everywhere that I go. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not going to expect people who aren't Christian to align with that necessarily. I'm going to recognize that I'm participating in a community that's broader than my own faith perspective, but um, is not exclusive of it. Like my, my faith perspective is something that is part of this community. Yeah, and so yeah. to acknowledge, and so, um, so I think that conversation for our, for our organization kind of reflected that shift. And, and that's just been like a learning journey for us of figuring out like what does that look like how do we best how do we best engage with the mm. community in that way and i think since that conversation it's been like 
confirmation after confirmation that that was a really good transition. And a lot of the things that we worried about in terms of like, well, this is going to alienate certain people or make it hard to work together. I think that's, we we've learned that that just wasn't true. And I think for me, uh, that's, that's been really beneficial to me in my own faith, because I think I grew up kind of with a similar posture of like, my faith is very important to me, but in certain contexts, I'm going to kind of filter myself. Mm -hmm. Don't rock the boat. Because, yeah, because um, I'm not sure how it's going to be received yeah. by other people. And so, um, so I think that the place that I wanted to go as, as we've continued to have conversations and I've, as I've listened to the podcast is um, I think part of that is uh, but part of what's resonated with me is as I've heard your story and as you shared the story in the podcast, it's sort of like you laid out this journey of like growing up in the church and kind of like encountering a lot of these struggles and, and wrestling with that and kind of like deconstructing and, and all of that. And I think I'm in a season of like recognizing that I have had a journey of deconstruction and reconstruction in my own life mm -hmm. and in my own faith journey that looks a lot different from yours, but hearing you talk about yours and hearing it's kind of like that it's become a topic that oh, yeah. more people are talking about. And whenever I was having that experience, I didn't have the language for it and people weren't really talking about it. And I never really thought of it that way because it wasn't like at no point did I walk away from Christianity or anything like that. But now that I hear people talking about their journey of deconstruction, it's kind of like, Oh, that's what I did. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, and, and, uh, and the, the difference for me between that language of deconstruction and deconversion yeah. is very helpful. Yes. Because yeah. I, I definitely identified what happened to me as a deconversion. Sure. But if I, if I go back a few more seasons into yeah. to the parts of my journey where I, I hadn't yet deconverted, mm -hmm. I was probably deconstructing. I think that actually is really helpful sure. language. And yeah. now really find myself in, um, reconstruction or or, yeah. or, or, or some, something like that to where I'm like, okay, I'm going to pull this piece back in and, you know, sit with it for a little bit. Okay. Like I'm praying now. Yeah. Like, okay, that's a big chunk. Yeah. <laughs> is it, is it, is it, is it fitting in? Is it, um, I don't want to say working, but yeah. I guess it is, it is working in, in, in some ways it's, it's working on me. Mm -hmm. Um, fasting, I pulled mm. fasting back in Yeah. and, um, it's it's working. It's yeah. like it's like it, it's landing in that way to where it's like okay, yes, this is good. This is this is something, and, right. and we're like we're in the Lenten season right now. We're also in the Ramadan season at the same time, which is really kind of cool. And so I'm putting those pieces back together, but I I wouldn't yet identify as a as a Christian still at this point. Interestingly sure. enough, yeah. So so if there is that sort of threshold label identity, something that needs to be crossed. Um, I'm I'm not there yet. Sure. I acknowledge that I'm sort of pointing there, but the the idea of a deconstruction and that language actually is really mm -hmm. helpful for me to yeah. to sort of understand that and, and hear others sort of tell their story in a way yeah. that allows for myriad levels of that journey. Yeah. And I think that distinction is really healthy and important for a lot of different people because I think what I've seen within the church community, at least the church communities that I'm a part of, is like deconstruction is just bad. It's like deconstruction. Avoided, yeah. It's like deconstruction leads to deconversion. It's this inevitable thing and uh and it's just bad. And it's not, you know, reminds and so, me real real quick. Yeah. It reminds me of I kiss dating goodbye. Do you remember that era? Yeah, or were you okay? Right. So it was like, okay, so sex before marriage is bad. So therefore, maybe dating before marriage is bad. Maybe right. kissing, like, and it was right. like, it was all, I was like, what is the purest version of this yeah. that we right. can get to? And so pretty soon it was like all romantic entanglements are bad. Yes. Right. And then there's there's been, you know, Josh Harris's whole, whole yeah. journey since then. But yeah. that was just quick digression because yeah, I that, think that encapsulates it's what a, you're saying it's about a, how the church has yeah. looked at deconstruction and maybe has the pendulum swung way too far one way. Yeah. And, and I think, 
I think underlying both of those ideas is like something that I'm beginning to recognize about the way that I was prior to this whole journey and the way something that maybe kind of characterizes a lot of faith communities is this sense of like, it's almost like an insecurity of like, Mm. I don't want my faith to be tested. I'm going to avoid testing what I believe or testing my faith or testing my own uh, like ability. Like I'm going to avoid all, I'm, I'm going to avoid all kinds of temptation and uh, all kinds hardship. of challenge. Yeah. And to some degree there's wisdom in that. Like you don't want to just walk around like I'm going to just dive head first into a highly, uh, you know, temptation laden environment. Well, <laughs> like it's, that's it's not why Peterson thing of like, like pick up the load that is, heavy enough for you to carry to be a challenge but not so heavy that you know yes, it, it right. freezes you or breaks you or something yeah. like that but not so light that it actually doesn't motivate you to move right and so just to share a little bit of like what that journey has been like for yeah. me i think i could characterize it in those terms and i could say i grew up as like the ultimate 90s church kid you know <laughs> so like i could fight you on that i i, I want to hear it i love it i love yeah, it yeah so I, I, I so let me let me identity. let me give you some of my accolades <laughs> okay. that support this claim. what would jesus do bracelets got to be in there and what would jesus do brace i actually had an i love jesus lanyard that i wore around my neck to school like for years People who grew up with me will remember this. It was like strong. That's pretty strong. I had the t-shirts. I had had this soccer shirt that said Jesus saves. And it was like Jesus as a goalie, like (laughs) diving to save the ball. Yes. Like all of that stuff. Um, Only listen to Christian music. Sure. No give me, give me Give me a couple bands that you were really into. That time. Uh, okay, so whenever I was like in high school and got sure. a little edgier, was really into Skillet. Yeah. Um, st- still kind of like, I've, I've kind of like, I went through this phase where it was like, ah, like all of the cheesy Christian music, like I'm going to put that aside. More recently, I like went back and listened to some of the songs the that I used stuff, to really yeah. like. And I was like, this is pretty good. I actually, it <laughs> holds up. I actually I agree. Like I agree. Um, but. Because you're a couple of years younger than me. What year were you born? 92. Okay. So you're 12 years younger than me. Yeah. So. I might have more of an early '90s edge for you, but maybe sure. you can you can take the title, you know, as, later. As, the, yeah. as the millennium, you know, yeah. crested. So yeah, uh, um, so those those were all features. I I grew up in a church where it was like you know VBS and skits. Like I was, I played mm. all the characters in the skits. <laughs> I was, actually. I so I started Salty, the song song book was that a thing in your in your era? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, that's more um, 80s. Yeah. But we uh you know, we did like puppet shows in kids church and I started like serving in kids church mm. as a kid. Like I was ministering to my peers to the other kids. and would do like the puppet shows and stuff. Um, this is where the creativity and the storytelling and all the yeah, things Yeah, it was to, incredibly uh, yeah. formative and uh like to the point that I I actually custom made a puppet for this particular Just Easter like skit that we did. See, you do have a history of cobbling. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that's the level of like, and and so beyond all of those kind of like church culture trappings, okay. I also had this reputation mm, as like school like, and like public places and stuff like that. School, public yeah. places, um, within my own church, like. I had this reputation as like this very solid Christian kid. No um, sex, no drugs, no smoking, right. no alcohol, no cussing. No cussing. Fr- right. Friends at school would accidentally let a cuss word slip. And, and I'd, I'd never had a problem with that. Like it was fine, <laughs> but they would apologize to me. And there was like oh, this. Jonathan heard me. Oh, no. Yeah, it was like, it was like oh, sorry, sorry, Jonathan. And I'm like, That's it's great. fine. That's great. But there was like this almost like respect and reverence of like, Jonathan is like, he is like a holy man. There's you know? Christians and then there's Jonathan. <laughs> that was the reputation. And and more than a reputation, it was like part of my self-identity. It sure. was like, that was, that was what I wanted to be known for. Mm. And that was how I saw myself was like, yeah. I, I love Jesus. And I, and I will say to this day, my faith was genuine in that upbringing. Oh, and like, absolutely. It I have was, no doubt. No it doubt. was, and so like, 
but I a think lot that's of also that, like how our our the, the state like our brains haven't developed all the way yet, and the sure. world is so black and white. And yes, when, when in something is so clearly white or light or whatever, you know, like yeah. good, it's really easy just sort of to understand yeah. that. Well, of course, I'm doing the right thing. Right. There's only there's only one choice here, so therefore, yeah. right. I should feel good about yeah. And doing it was all right. very yeah. It was all very simple, all very black and white, and it was like. I I wanted to be seen that way and and some of that was healthy some of it was like motivated by genuine love for Jesus genuine love for other people um but a lot of it was like that was where my sense of like self-worth was was like I'm I'm doing it right you know mm-hmm. and like people at church would like commend me on how good of a person I was I I I still remember this woman at church saying to me I hope my son grows up to be like you. Hmm. And it was like, that felt really good. Sure. And I started preaching in our church at like 15. So like wow. preaching to our youth group um, fairly regularly, preaching on Sunday mornings every now and then. Like we did like a youth Sunday. And so like yeah. being recognized for that and like pat on the back, like, wow, God's really going to use you in, in powerful ways and things like that. Like that was that was like part of where I found value. Did did that correspond with like a vocational calling to where you were like, oh, this is the thing that I'm going to do vocationally? Potentially. Okay. I, I don't know that I was ever like, I'm, I'm definitely going to be a pastor. It definitely appealed to me the idea of like being on stages and preaching places. Okay. You know, like in youth group, you'd go to like these big conferences and yeah. these really cool oh, yeah. youth pastors would get up there and it was like, that's, that's what I want to be, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, uh, you, you actually recommended to me, uh, the podcast, the rise and fall of Mars Hill. And we had a conversation about it after I started listening. And I think I told you one of the things that I recognized uh, as I was listening is it was like, man, a lot of really nasty stuff here. And for me, it was like, that could have been me. Mm. I, I think that I was very easily. You were gifted in the same similar ways that Mark was, and, and and I and I think it was like a lot of the a lot of the internal things, a lot of the shadow side mm-hmm. that I came to recognize in myself. It was like that, like I could have I could have easily been on that trajectory had God not intervened and not broken those things down. Um, and so, so for me, it was like. Grew up in this very sheltered church environment. That was my reputation. And then when I like graduated high school and went to college, two really pivotal things happened. One, I was out of that sheltered environment. I was... Where'd uh, you go to college? I went to UE. Okay. And the so, University of Evansville. Yeah. And so at the University of Evansville, there was this interesting mix of like people who came from religious backgrounds like me and also people who wore the label of Christian but believed very different things mm. than I did. It's a um, it's a Methodist, technically a Methodist right. school, or like that was sort of its, its founding. Yeah. But did you come from a Methodist church yourself? Mm-hmm. Okay. No, so I came from like a, a non-denominational church that basically looked like an Assemblies of God oh, church. Okay. Um, so Some charismatic well, elements as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that okay. was a big part of my church experience growing up. Um, and so was in this environment with like, um, people who identified as Christian and looked a lot like me, people who identified as Christian and looked very different from me, um, as well as people who just did not identify with that label at all. And so encountered a lot of questions and a lot of like my worldview and, and the things that seem so black and white, mm. now there were questions that like, oh, I haven't encountered that question before. And, and I don't have a black and white answer for it. Um, and at the same time, uh, my, at the same time, I was uh, in a, my first ever like really serious dating relationship. Mm. So you had not kissed dating goodbye like my era did. Correct. But I mean, because I was when you were in that age, that was like it was like peak kiss dating goodbye. So yeah. I'm like freshman co- year of college. It's a girl I'm really interested in. Yeah. And we have agreed to both not date together and just sort of like 
long yeah. for each other. Yeah. But she recommended that I apply for this internship in okay. some place called Evansville, Indiana. Yeah. Okay. And completely changed the course of my life. Yeah. Not dating her. Right. Completely changed the course of my life. Yeah. Wow. Um, but you're dating. Sorry. Yeah. So I was dating. I will say, like, for me, it was like, uh, I I was like pretty committed to the idea of like I'm dating for the purpose of you're, deciding you're, yeah, like you're looking for a wife if we're gonna yeah. get married. Um, Some people are looking for a good time. You're looking for a long time. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and but what? So that was like my intention going into the relationship, but quickly like realized I uh, am am not the uh, like pinnacle of sexual purity that I thought I was. Mm. You know. So like we began to be intimate, deeply intimate emotionally and physically. Mm. And it was kind of like alarming to me. And it was like, you know, of course it's in the context of this relationship. I'm like head over heels in love. Cause this is like the first real deep relationship that I've had like this. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, this is not like, this is not okay. And I know it's not okay. Mm. And I'm, I'm really struggling to like, maintain the boundaries that I've held for a long time that are so black and white. But also even deeper than that, whenever our relationship got really serious and began to kind of like become unhealthy and like move towards like, we're probably going to break up. It revealed a lot of like just lack of personal integrity in me that like Mm -hmm. I responded to that with a lot of insecurity. And it was like, I can be really insecure. I can be really selfish. I can be really manipulative. And it was like this, I, I'm not as good of a person as I thought I was. Wow. And, and that was, and so if I'm framing that up as a period of deconstruction, for me, it was like, I began to take apart different pieces of my belief system and reevaluate them and, and question them and study scripture for myself in deep ways that I hadn't done before. But it was also like my personal integrity and sense of identity were being broken. Like they were, they were falling apart under the weight of temptation and relational turmoil. And it was, it was that idea of like, I had never allowed my faith and my sense of formation to be tested. Mm. And now it was being tested and it was falling apart. Mm. And it was like, my trust in myself was really shaken and my trust in my church community and like the formation that had happened there was really shaken. It was like, I don't know that I've been prepared to follow Jesus as well as I thought that I was Mm. because I was really counting on my faith to make me a good person. And it didn't work, <laughs> you know? It's like, this is like, this is really bad. Yeah. I'm I'm a sinner and I like really need Jesus. It's and, impressive though that you, you, there are so many that go through those situations and externalize the, mm-hmm. the, the cause of that. And you could have written off, you know, that girl as like, she she's Delilah, you know, who yeah, sort right. of tempted, you know, the, the, the pure, you know, Jonathan and um, you, Jonathan, not, Biblical Jonathan. I, I, I know my... <laughs> yeah, my, you're not mixing Samson. up I got it right. I right. got it right. But yeah. like like the fact that you did sort of have the the wisdom that you would probably cultivated through all of those. Like I said, I think you, you had a real faith. Yeah. Like right. the, you wanted wisdom to sort of reign in your life and you wanted integrity. Mm-hmm. You knew that that was actually a part of it and you believed that you had it. And when right. it was exposed that you didn't, it was a you problem and not mm-hmm. an other people problem. And therefore you could right. healthily address it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I would say the thing that I've, I don't think I, again, I wasn't consciously like processing all this in the moment. It was like this, it was like this storm of just like chaos. And I was just like trying to get through it and figure out like what's going on. But looking back and reflecting and in, in hindsight vision, um, I think one of the really like important things that happened for me in that moment was like my trust in myself, my trust in my church and my belief system was a little bit shaken, but my trust in Jesus like was still there. Mm. And it was kind of like, 
I still, I still felt really sure that Jesus was a real person and that he was really good mm. and that he was the way, the truth and the life. Mm. And so it was like all of these questions came and I didn't wonder, is Jesus real? And is, is all of this true? I wondered, did I miss something? Do I really understand who Jesus is? Do I really understand what he's doing in the world? And it drove me to this like pursuit of Jesus, the person. It was like, it was like the stripping away of all of these other aspects of faith. And it was like, I want to, I want to lean into Jesus, the person mm. who I feel like I have a genuine personal relationship with. And I'm just going to like cling to him and, and ask him to help me get through this. Like, mm. Help me make sense of these questions that I have. Help me find my way to like a better way of living and a better way of following you and and take all of these like broken pieces of me and and kind of put them back together. And and I th- it, it oh, almost feels like you just to bring back something I didn't expect to bring back. It almost feels like you were like steel manning Jesus in a way of like. Jesus, you must hmm. be saying something that I'm not getting here. Like there was there was a trust of the 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 transmission that was coming to you wasn't fully being received hmm. and that the problem yeah. was on the side of the receiver. Yeah. Yes. And I and maybe the transmission as well. It was like I know oh, sure, sure. It was like I know well, Jesus is out there somewhere. Sure. And I know that he's true and, and real and I've and I've I've had enough of a relationship with him to really trust like he is good. And I know that I'm not, and I know that I'm realizing more and more that the church is not intrinsically good. Like it has flaws. Mm. Um, And so it was like, if I want to, if I want to find something solid and put all of this back together in a way that's cohesive, I've got to start with like, Jesus, like I've got to lean into him. And it really like, I I think that brought me to this place that has shaped me ever since of like, that was kind of like the beginning of your reconstruction right there. Like, I like think that, that so. yeah, is I think almost so. a low point in the, yeah, it was kind of low point. Yeah. And it, and it was like, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever be able to put all this back together, but I, I, I know that I, I know that I don't want to lose Jesus. Because I, I really believe that he's good, really believe that he loves me, and I really love him. And I, and it was almost like this trust of like, oh, okay, I'm being forced to trust Jesus in a way that I never have before. Because before it was kind of like I was kind of holding all this together and doing the right thing, and it was untested. And now it was like, okay, I'm kind of falling apart here. This is a big mess. What I believe is falling apart. And I'm I'm not in control anymore. Um, and I really just like, out of desperation almost, was like, I just I just kind of need Jesus to show up mm-hmm. in this moment. And I feel like when I leaned into that, I felt like He did. You know, it was like there. It was like I leaned in looking for something solid, and there was something solid there. And it was like that was the only sense of like comfort and stability that I had was like, okay, I'm, I'm, and then it, it gave me, it gave me like the peace that I needed to be able to ask the hard questions. Mm. And so I don't want to paint this picture of like, I went through deconstruction and reconstruction (laughs) and now I've got this really, even better than before. Now I've got this really (laughs) solid faith that I've put together and I've answered all the questions, but it, what it did is it kind of like, it set me in a different direction where Mm. it was like, Now I can ask all of those hard questions. Now I feel much more comfortable engaging. Like Mm -hmm. how I talked about that insecurity, that insecurity was gone. It was like, it was like, I don't have anything to fear now because it's already all kind of gone to pieces. Um, But I feel like Jesus showed up for me in that moment. And it's kind of like, I've been able to trust him with falling apart before. And now I if I fall What's apart the worst again, thing to get thrown at you. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. like if I fall yeah. apart again or something that I believe gets really challenged, like uh, I'm not as worried about that now because um, whatever kind of insecurity was there that was like, don't go there, don't ask those questions. Mm-hmm. It was like, 
Well, now, now I've been to some of those places and I've been to some of those dark, scary yeah, yeah. places. And now it's like, I'm not scared to go there anymore. And when I say dark, scary places, I mean the dark, scary places that were like out there in the world, mm-hmm. you know, like don't, don't yeah. go out there, you know, where the, Jesus the sinful people are, where the yeah. people who are, you know, believing lies are, but also the dark, scary places like in my own heart. Mm. And so that's where I think I mentioned like language that's been very helpful for me that I've just recently learned is uh, this framework of the critical journey. In the first three stages, our faith or our spirituality takes its expression most frequently in ways that are prescribed by external standards, whether by the church, a spiritual leader, a book, or a set of principles. But stages four through six represent a diff- difficult personal transformation and a reemerging that require a rediscovery on a different level of what faith and spirituality are all about. These, they tell us, are inner healing stages, both spiritually and psychologically, for which the journey can't be prescribed. We can talk about each of those steps, but the thing that was helpful for me in that was like, it gave some language to like this experience that I'd had and the the journey inward of like, now I'm becoming acquainted with the parts of myself that I don't want to acknowledge to the rest of the world and the journey outward of like, now I'm, I'm kind of reemerging from that and I'm more able to bring something good to the world. It was like that, that's what happened to me. You know, I think, I, I think we should go there and I want to frame it in, in the way similar to what we had talked about before of, of sort of a black and white and yeah. almost like this, there was this sort of static box or there was like this line that you were expected to cross that was sort of drilled into me and my church experiences was become a Christian or get baptized Mm -hmm. or whatever that sort of like threshold crossing into like, okay, now you're done. Like, yeah, you did it. It's yep. That's it. You're going to heaven. And you know what? The rest of it is just, we don't even have to think about that anymore. Well, and it's like, you just got to try your best to survive yeah. <laughs> until Jesus comes and, back and or you die. And maybe even implicit in that is avoid some of these hard questions. Yeah. Avoid some of these dark places. Yeah. And the 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 calling of Jesus is come and follow me. Mm-hmm. Like, like that's it. Or, the, and then I'll make you fishers of men or something like that. Like then yeah. it goes further, but it's, but it's not, don't follow me everywhere. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's, and the even the the motion of that, like yeah. of following, you're talking about a journey, like going right. somewhere. You don't know what is going to be there when you get there, so you can't mm-hmm. just like say, "All right, I'm in this, I'm in this box, and I'm done." Yeah, it's it's committing to someplace that is mysterious and committing to do it with somebody mm-hmm. is that's the box if if you need a box, but it's not static. It's yeah. dynamic and it's moving right. and. To me, that was different than the way that I had approached yeah. my faith when I was younger. And which is why also, because that's how I understood it as being in the box or out of the box, mm-hmm. my deconstruction necessitated a deconversion. It was like, yeah, it was I like, to, I, I don't fit in the box, box right? anymore. So now this I got to get what's out. available to me to experience inside right. the box. So if I want yeah. to experience all of life, mm-hmm. I have to get outside of the box. Yeah. And so now it's like yeah. I've shifted back to I'm turning towards Jesus, but it's it's it is a path. It's a, it's a movement. Mm-hmm. So if, however, somebody wants to define themselves as a Christian or whatever, like I said, I can't make that leap yet. But the yeah. whole idea of like being a follower of the way, mm-hmm. like check that box. Like yeah. I I am compelled and I am following the way of Jesus. Now. Right. Yeah. So let's let's move to this spiritual path um, yeah. concept that has yeah. come alive for you recently, and where yeah. where you first heard it from, because I think we heard it from the same. Place, I think we did, yeah. But not, I told, but not I, sure. Yeah, you're like, hey, yeah. you should check this out. I was like, oh, well, I was already listening to it. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I should say, I'm not like I haven't studied this deeply. It it's something that I just recently got sure. turned on to, and and am in the process of studying it more deeply. But was listening to. Uh, an episode of the Kerry Newhoff podcast mm-hmm. with John Mark Comer. Yeah, this concept they call the wall, which is some kind of an experience. I think of the AA line, the only way out is through, meaning it's some kind of an experience of pain and suffering that you can't bypass or deny or fake it till you make it. 
it's something that will permanently stand in your path. Uh, we, I, I got served the same yeah. podcast well, episode we have the same, on YouTube. I think we, oh, okay. I was going to say, I think we have the same friends who... Um, no, this was tell this was the, so this just this came the, up for this you. This was the YouTube algorithm yeah. saying you might like this, and I'm like, okay, yeah, oh, okay, because well. I had just listened to one of him with Simon Sinek. Okay, Carrie, yeah, yeah. And it, which uh-huh. was also phenomenal. Yeah, I'll have to check that one out. I haven't, yeah, I haven't yeah. heard it. Okay, um, so it's an ep- excellent episode. And they wait, talk about you know Kerry? Like you guys did an event with him, right? We did. I don't know him like personally. Um, I mean, you've, but, you've had conversation. Like you, yeah. you've collaborated on an yeah. event in Evansville with yes. for Evansville where mm-hmm. he, he appeared came in, virtually he and, came and spoke yeah yeah he appeared virtually with church leaders um and did like a presentation and a Q&A um in the early stages of COVID and it was like a leadership it was an opportunity to encourage church leaders in their leadership and help them think about navigating yeah. All of the chaos. I somehow got invited to that, and it was awesome. Yeah, no, he he did a great job at at helping to kind of like make sense of here's where we're at, and here's what some things that you can think about. Um, yeah, he's gifted. So the episode with John Mark Comer, though, there are lots of really good things in there. But the thing that was most valuable to me was when he mentioned this critical journey, and and essentially it's a it's six different sort of like stages that you could be in and it's not necessarily linear you could go across different ones but the six stages are the first three are like the typical thresholds that you were talking about the first one is recognition of god it's that idea of like when you first become a christian and it's like exciting and everything's new and lots of discovery of there's like there's no wow. fervor like the newly converted yeah that's right and then two is uh called the life of discipleship and so it's where you begin to develop some of those formative practices and habits of prayer like, and fasting yeah it's like <laughs> i've i'm i'm praying now i'm going to church these are the sure. these are the things that christians do you know it's like i'm going to read my bible i might learn about fasting and how to do that and and all of these different practices that help me become what i'm trying to become you know and then three is the productive life so it's the idea that as i'm being formed it's producing fruit in my life. And that might mean that I'm playing some kind of leadership role at church or like helping to disciple other Christians, uh, helping them be formed in these habits and practices. Um, Puppet ministry. Puppet ministry. (laughs) Um, Also, like my faith begins to inform my participation in the broader community. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about my job and my family through the lens of Christianity. Um, or whatever other belief system you might have, because I think you can apply these stages to sure. another, you know, another spiritual journey. Um, so, so that's three, and that's that's the phase where, for a lot of Christians, it's kind of like good. I'm there, I'm yeah. being productive, I'm producing fruit. Like I'm just going to do this the rest of my life until I die, or until Jesus returns, and. Uh, and then I'm done and I've run right, the faithful or to, race. Or I go to University of Evansville and meet a girl. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and so then uh, this is where it's like, okay, I get all of those things. That that all felt familiar. There's a left turn coming. But then there's, yeah, there's a left turn. There's this pivotal moment of like, oh, there are three more stages. And, and these are the things that really like came alive for me. Um, they talked about how between three and four, there's what they call the wall, which I think is mm-hmm. such an appropriate name because that's what it felt like for me. It was like you hit the wall and you the, came the, apart. The 20 mile mark in a marathon. Like your, <laughs> your nose is bloody and you are disoriented and you don't know what to do. And so the wall can be a crisis of faith. It can be questions like the ones that I was asking, it can be a moment of personal crisis where something unthinkable happens and you're just coming apart as a person. And uh, and that triggers uh, one of two reactions. Either you enter this fourth phase, which is the journey inward, where it's like, I'm going to I'm going to become introspective about like, what are the things in me that are broken that I didn't want to acknowledge before, but now they're there, I can't ignore them anymore. Um, or you decide to just leave that spiritual journey and start a new one. And, and it's like, 
I hit this wall. This isn't working for me anymore. I'm going to go, I'm going to start a different journey and, and, and go back to phase one and rethink about what would I define as, as God or ultimate reality. And which which is basically that. the path that, that I took. Yeah. So and, I'm, I'm going to be an atheist. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm going to, and I'm going to redo steps one through three because this was, this was not the right steps. I'm going to go back to the drawing board and I'm going to, I'm going to try again. Um, and so for me, it was, it was, it was phase four. It was like, I'm, I'm looking inside of myself and finding a lot of things that, uh, I'm ashamed of, you know, it's like, this has been here the whole time and I knew it was here, but I didn't want to acknowledge it to myself or to God or to anybody else. And now it's like, there's no hiding from it. Mm. And so, uh, I'm so even seeing like the, the, the metaphor of like, like the sun or, 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 like, or like coming closer to the light yeah, and just like that idea yeah. of like, Oh wow, there's stuff that I just couldn't see in in, in the shadows or, or the less light that yeah. I, that I was sort of at before. Yeah, yeah, and it's like to to go back to the conversation we started with about like YouTube and social media. It's like it's like the filtered Instagram version of myself. Now now you see behind that, and mm-hmm. it's like you meet somebody in person that you've only seen on YouTube, and yeah. it's like oh, you got some parts of you that. <laughs> Are like, sure. but it, but it's yourself, it you know, it's like, I've only, I haven't been looking in the mirror. I've been looking at my Instagram, mm. you know, and now I'm looking in the mirror, believing your own height. And it's like, Ooh, this isn't so good. Mm. And so, and so that season is all about like being able to, being able to become familiar with those things in the case of Christianity to submit them to Jesus and to begin to like repent and heal. And I think that's that's what the journey was for me. It was like I got a lot of junk in here that is hurtful to me. My my capacity to hurt other people is alarming to me, and I don't want to I don't want to be that anymore. Mm. Um, and so, beginning to unpack that, submit it to Jesus, and then the fifth stage is like once I've done some healing and I've now I'm ready to kind of go back to phase three of the productive life, but I'm, I'm now approaching it more whole and more pure than I was before. And my motivations, my actions might be exactly the same. Mm. I might be doing a lot of the same things, same types of ministry. In fact, for me, a a lot of that is true. Mm. I was preaching, I was teaching the Bible before I still preach and teach the Bible, but my motivations are drastically different. In Mm. fact, I often spend a good amount of time in prayer before I have any opportunity to teach, just asking God to, to ensure that my motivation is to love the people who I'm, I'm going to have the opportunity to sit with and teach because I don't want it to be about me and I don't want it to be about impressing people. Um, and so like you emerge with, motivations that are more pure and you're able to be productive in more wholesome ways, I think. And you're integrated and aligned if there is a larger spirit that is attempting to move through you and with you, you are aligned with that in the same sort of flow. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then stage six is the life of love, which is like the the pinnacle of, Mm -hmm. of probably you've probably you're really old and you've gone through seasons four and five a lot. You, you went to season five and then you hit another wall (laughs) and you went back to four and it was like, Oh, there's some more junk in here that I need to submit to Jesus. And I think the more that happens, maybe the easier it gets because it's like, well, like you said, you, 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 there was nothing, there's nothing to be afraid of once you've realized that, the burning away of all the chaff yeah. you were still left or even using the other side of that metaphor of the the baby in the bathwater it's like yeah. once all the dirty <laughs> bathwater got drained you still found the baby of yeah, christ right. there that you knew yeah was enough yeah we need to fill the bath bathtub up again and that baby's gonna get cold sure. I don't know, the, the metaphor <laughs> just fell apart a little bit but yeah but it, well you, there's you, a little bit of like the talladega nights little baby <laughs> jesus dear lord baby jesus or as our brothers to the south call you, hey Zeus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of dominoes, KFC, and 
the always delicious Taco Bell. Yes. <laughs> In that metaphor somewhere. Um, but yes, it's like you go through that process again and again. And every time you do, it's like it's just as painful as it was before. But it's like a good kind of pain now because you know what's on the other side. You know that there's joy and hope. In, in being put back together. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like I can, I can fully embrace being broken apart because I can trust that Jesus is going to put me back together. And I think for me, there's this realization that happened fairly recently, actually in the last few months of like, if at the very foundation of my faith is this belief that someday I'm going to close my eyes in death And Jesus is going to, I can trust Jesus in that moment. Like I'm going to totally let go and, and I'm going to cease to be, and I'm trusting that Jesus is going to raise me back to life and, and, and bring life back into my mortal body. If I can trust Jesus with that, I can trust him with every kind of like coming apart that could happen before that. And, and it's just, it's again, it's not I don't feel like I've arrived. It's almost like the journey's just started for me. And it's like, now I'm, I'm just like ready for it. I'm like, I'm just waiting for like, when's the next wall, you know? And I got two, two things that are really alive for me on this of what you're just saying that, that, that I want to bring up. And then we can, we can try and try and land this, Mm -hmm. uh, this, this conversation. First one is about, and I did not know I would want to go here, but just sort of physical, almost biological Mm. aspects of like health even. Like have you, I don't, we haven't ever had this conversation before, but I assume you work out? A little bit. You run, lift weights, swim, Mm -hmm. what do you do? Uh, Usually run um, because that's what I have time for. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a stress reliever. Um, Oftentimes when I go to the park with my three boys, I'll play tag with them or do, I'll try to incorporate some kind of physical activity into like us playing together. Um, And sometimes I'll just work out at the park while they're playing. And then every once in a while I'll go to the gym. Um, not as but you're you're, as you're like. breaking your body down or training mm-hmm. your body away, and then it gets sort of rebuilt yeah. back up. Like right. you have practices that take you to some sort of of limit, and yeah. then you're sort of raised back up stronger. That from are doing uncomfortable. It yeah, yep. that are uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. So I don't know why I wanted to go there. There's a, there seems to be something there when you're talking about sort of being realigned and mm-hmm. reintegrated and, and sort of on that path to where. Yeah. Well, that's the way that. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about it, right? He says, all runners run, but only one gets the prize. Mm. He says, run in such a way as to get the prize. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I think before I was just kind of jogging along in this comfortable little pace, Mm. didn't want to be pushed, didn't want to be challenged. Um, And now it's like, I want to run to the limit. You know, it's like, I want to, I want to, I want to train and I want to discipline my self in that way. Um, and, and that's the language he uses too, of like strict discipline. Mm-hmm. And, and he's not talking about, I think, just like some kind of strict morality and things like that. It's this sense of like, I want to be deeply committed to really doing the things that Jesus wants me to do. And I want to be deeply committed to doing the things that are painful. And, and I've, I've come to recognize that like you can grow by embracing your own pain or you can grow by embracing the pain of others. Mm. And I much Mm. prefer entering into the pain of other people and practicing compassion and letting God draw the things in me that are selfish out in that way. I much prefer that over like just experiencing pain and, and brokenness in the context of my own relationships in life, mm. you know? Um, but there's something about practicing compassion and selflessness that like it's painful and it draws out like, Oh, why don't, why don't I want to do this thing that I know I ought to do? Oh, it's well, because you, I'm selfish. <laughs> specifically when you said the word draws out there, like I'm reminded of the examples of Jesus performing physical healings. Mm-hmm. 
and that there, there's even that that passage that talks about like someone sort of reaches out to him and, and touches him without like his yeah like being ready for it or acknowledging right. it and and he feels power like drain from him yeah right and i'm just just sort of struck in this moment of, of how much the accounts of jesus's ministry have to do with physical improvement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a restoration of like cells yeah like you were blind, now you see. Right. You are lame, now you walk. You had right. leprosy, now your skin is whole again. Yeah. And the sort of really tangible aspects of the, the ministry of For Evansville, and I think your heart and your mm -hmm. team's heart around like poverty and health, like in particular, it's just yeah. like, these are tangible, obvious needs that these people have. Mm -hmm. And if we are feeling inspired, called, passionate to minister to mm -hmm. those in our community, and it's not addressing that, yeah. then it's missing the mark. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would say whenever we look at the ministry of Jesus in like physical healing, welcoming people in mm -hmm. that were marginalized, these are, all, these are all like expressions <laughs> of Jesus is trying to show people, here's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Mm -hmm. It's It's... It's like a taste of it. It's like a free trial version. You know, it's like, hey, here's what it is. Do you want to come be a part of the whole package? You know, do you want to subscribe? <laughs> um, and do so, you subscribe like, to the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And so, like, that, that is what For Evansville is trying to do is like, we, we want to cultivate a community where um, people who are following Jesus are creating that free trial version of the kingdom of heaven here in Evansville. And what I would say in response to kind of how you characterize that is it's not just, Hey, here are these people who have these needs. We need to go meet those needs. It's an acknowledgement that we're all part of a community together. And there are some shadow sides to us as individual people and to us collectively as the church that have to be acknowledged in order for that healing and restoration to happen. And what I mean by that specifically is, is back to that point of like systemic inequity and, and, and like what are the underlying conditions that have created the problems that exist in our sure. community? We're all part of that system together. And we need to acknowledge that like for middle and upper class Christians who have kind of just bought into the American way of life, we're contributing to those problems. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's like a journey inward that we need to have to say, maybe the way that I'm living isn't as harmless as I think that it is. Ooh. Maybe Ooh, that has landed. That maybe landed. maybe I need to submit mm -hmm. some things in me to Jesus in order for our community to be more healed and whole. Like like the transformation that we want to do is out there. And I, and I grew up in a community that like our church was very outwardly focused for like many years whenever I was young. And that was very formative and good mm -hmm. for me. But what I've learned now is like showing up and volunteering and like doing an, an event at the park and feeding people and stuff like that. Like that's only scratching the surface and, and maybe the transformation that really needs to happen is right here in my own heart. And if I can embrace that posture of repentance first, mm. then I can enter into those spaces in a way that's more whole. Mm. And maybe the followers of Jesus who are most affected by the issues in our community actually have something to teach me about how to live like Jesus. It's great because where you just went is actually, the, it's the segue of the second thing that I sort of wanted to, to close with, which is, like no 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 bullshit no like an answer that you feel like you would need to give as wearing your four Evansville cap like as honest as you can be okay do you feel that something unique is happening in our community in the hearts of people right now yes i there's certainly something unique that's happening in my own heart Mm. And I think that I see that happening in other places too. <laughs> yeah. I'm feeling it, man. I'm feeling it. And uh, 
yeah, I, I think about, um, I think about this parable where Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. He says it's like a mustard seed. Mm. And this is different from the place where he says, if you have faith, the size of a mustard seed, that's, that's a different thing. Okay. Good clarification. Um, But he has, he has a parable where he says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's, it's small and insignificant, but it grows to be the largest tree in the garden, large enough for birds to come and nest in its branches. And it's this beautiful picture of like this thing that we're talking about, this way of living, this way of being in the community starts out really small and insignificant. Um, It's buried in the ground. It's unseen. It dies. And then it grows. And when it grows, it grows big. Hmm. And it grows big enough that it provides refuge to other creatures birds birds (laughs) the birds come to nest yeah and Mm. and and this is in a series of parables where jesus gives similar analogies he talks about the kingdom of heaven is like yeast it's Mm. this living thing that exists within bread and it starts out really small but then it's kind of mixed in with the bread and it eventually the whole loaf becomes leaven and you mm. see that's like, like that's what happened with God's kingdom as a result of Jesus ministry. Christians lived, followed the way of Jesus, and it just slowly, gently grew and it changed the fabric of the communities that they were a part of. And I think that's that's like what I long to see in our city. And that's what I think like the church is called to be. And, and frankly, I just don't see that happening with the way that we're living or doing church right now or the way that we've been doing it. And so for me, like that process of deconstruction and reconstruction is like, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how do I live in that way that like my life is producing that kind of goodness in our community and how can I help other people find their way there? And I think it all comes down to like the person of Jesus. It's not a set of ideals. It's not a, it's not a set of practices. It's, I have to, I have to align myself and truly become in union with Jesus, the person. Um, and I have to let his life be expressed through my life in like unique ways that are going to, produce that kind of fruit and produce that kind of result. And, uh, yeah, like that's, that's what's stirring in my heart. And I, and I do see that stirring in the hearts of other people. There's like this restlessness for it. There's mm-hmm. this longing for it. That's mm-hmm. like, I'm not Something's satisfied to be born. Yeah. And I think I've been thinking a lot about, um, the apostle Peter, um, so we talked recently about Dune too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had this realization that, like, I, I watched it twice. I watched it a second time. I saw it in IMAX. So good. Um, the second time was in IMAX? A second time was yeah. in IMAX. Yeah, it was so good. Um, I had this realization that Paul Atreides is exactly what people wanted Jesus to be. Mm, the warrior king. He's this warrior king. He's this Messiah figure who's going to overthrow the empire by force. I am Paul Mwadib Atreides, Duke of Arrakis. Erudi dina heshidani, nelisan al-gai, rui dimen aruk, ashidi, nelisan al-gai. And, uh, and I had this realization of like, some people still want Jesus to be that today. And, uh, had that realization with kind of this smugness in my heart of like, <laughs> Ooh, I can see know, through the lines can, here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I, and then I realized I kind of had this moment of humility of like, and Peter was one of those people. Mm. And I was like, Jesus built his church. He said to Peter, you're the rock on which I'll build my church. 
Jesus built his church on somebody who was that way. And so I started to think about Peter's journey and his deconstruction. And you have this moment in the garden where like he is ready to die for Jesus he cuts off the ear. Of he might this take a couple people down with him, but he's yeah, yeah, you know. But he's not afraid. Sure, um, he's not afraid to die for Jesus, but he is afraid to lose. The fact that Peter draws his sword, cuts off the dude's ear, um, and then Jesus heals the guy, and Peter's like, "What are you doing?" Like we're, he, we're supposed to be breaking this person down, he, maybe even killing them. He thought this was the moment, mm. and then it's like. Jesus just goes and he allows himself to be taken. And, and like, I think that's Peter's wall. I think he hit that moment. Oh, he denies him three times after that, right? Yeah. And has to go in. And then there's this beautiful story at the end of the, uh, uh, the book of John where Jesus meets him on the beach and cooks him breakfast and kind of restores him. But I think, uh, I think the church kind of needs that journey of like, we got to, we got to put away the sense of like trying to accomplish things through worldly power. And there might be people listening to this who relate to Peter in that moment. There might be people listening to this who relate to Malchus, who's the servant. Mm -hmm. And they've been like, a part of me has been lopped off by the church and I'm not interested in Jesus. I'm not interested in the church because I've been deeply wounded. And I think to both of those people, Jesus is like, I want to, I want to bring like healing and restoration to the person who's been hurt by the church. Like I, I want to heal those wounds. And to the person who's done the hurting, he says, Hey, I want to, I want to like, I want to invite you into building God's kingdom, but you got to put the sword away and you've got to like, you've got to like sit on the beach with Jesus for a little bit and unpack some of the things in you that were just really not fit for building God's kingdom. A third time, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter became sad because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And so he said to him, Lord, You know everything. You know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. And then you've got to like commit to, I'm willing to suffer and die. I'm willing to lose in order that God's kingdom if might that's reign. where following yeah. leads to following that. into the way of Jesus, which mm-hmm. is like, oh, the way, the way of Jesus is a way of like suffering and self denial and self sacrifice yeah. for the compassion of others. Amen. <laughs> um, I feel that too, and I, uh, I I sense that that is going to be happening. I know we're going to have another conversation like this, but I do want to bring this to a close yeah thank you for what i think was another canonical conversation (laughs) at least for me yeah and uh yeah so for whatever's next uh i'm buckling up and and glad to have you as a a fellow uh sojourner on this journey yeah get get yourself some boots and we'll be on the journey together okay next time (laughs) yeah i'll have the boots Oh yeah, and I definitely got the boots.